In this video, we will be covering some new methods for integration, including long division, inverse trig antiderivative rules, and completing the square. The first method that we'll talk about is long division. So polynomial long division is probably a process that you are familiar with from Algebra 2. To integrate a function in which the degree of the numerator is greater than or equal to the degree of the denominator, that is when you would use long division. So to do polynomial long division, first you divide using long division or synthetic division, then you rewrite the integral, and then you integrate each part of that new integral using the appropriate method. Let's practice this with example one. So we're looking for the antiderivative or the indefinite integral of 3x squared plus 4 over x minus 1. In this case, I'm going to use synthetic division, and then in the next one, I will use long division. So to do synthetic division, we look at the denominator, which in this case is x minus 1. So that means that we have a 1 that goes in the little box up in the corner. We're just setting up the structure for our synthetic division. And then whenever we do polynomial long division or synthetic division, we need to rewrite things using placeholders. So in this case, that looks like instead of just 3x squared plus 4, we need to write that as 3x squared plus 0x plus 4 because we need to have something in every place. Then we line up the coefficients along the top here. So this becomes 3, 0, and 4. And then we can start the process of synthetic division. So first we bring the 3 down, and that one goes right there. 1 times 3 is 3, 0 plus 3 is 3, 1 times 3 is 3, and 4 plus 3 is 7. Then we put our little box there. This means that 7 is our remainder. So to interpret this result, this means that our answer is really 3x plus 3 plus 7 over x minus 1, because that was our original denominator. So now we've done step 1. Step 2 is to rewrite the integral. So now I'm going to rewrite this as the integral of 3x plus 3 plus 7 over x minus 1 dx. So I've just taken what I got after I did the synthetic division and plugged that in for the integrand instead. Now I'm going to integrate each part using the appropriate method. So I'm actually going to break this into two integrals. I'm going to say it's the integral of 3x plus 3 dx plus the integral of 7 over x minus 1 dx, and then I can evaluate each of those separately. To find the integral of 3x plus 3 dx, that's just going to be 3x squared over 2 plus 3x, and then we do have a plus c on the end there, but since we also have a plus c over here, we will just add on 1 to the end. Then for this one, I'm going to need to use u substitution. I'm going to say let u be equal to x minus 1. And then I take the derivative, so this means that du dx is equal to 1, which means that du is equal to dx. Then I can pull the 7 out to the front, so this is really 7 times the integral of 1 over u du, and we know that the integral of 1 over u du is really the natural log of the absolute value of u. So we have 7 times the natural log of the absolute value of u. Now I'm going to put these two parts together and write my answer. It's going to be 3 halves x squared plus 3x plus 7 times the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1, plugging x minus 1 back in for u over here, plus c. And there's my answer. Problem 2 is going to be another example where we need to use polynomial long division because the degree of the numerator, which is x to the fourth, the degree is 4, is greater than the degree of the denominator, which is 2. We have x squared down there. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to use synthetic division like I did up here because it's a little harder to do synthetic division when you don't have something like x minus 1 or x plus 2 in the denominator. So in this case, I am just going to do long division. However, I need to rewrite all of my placeholders. So my dividend is going to be x to the fourth plus 0x cubed plus 0x squared minus 2x minus 9. And my divisor will be x squared plus 0x plus 3. Now I am all set up to do the long division. First, what do I need to multiply x squared by to get it to x to the fourth? Well, that is x squared. So then I do x squared times x squared, which is x to the fourth, x squared times 0x, which is 0x cubed, and x squared times 3, which is 3x squared. And then I need to subtract that entire thing. So I am left with negative 3x squared. And then I can bring down my other terms. I'll bring down the negative 2x and the negative 9. The next thing I do is ask myself, how many times does x squared go into negative 3x squared? Well, it goes in negative 3 times. Then I do negative 3 times x squared, which is negative 3x squared, 
negative three times zero x, which is zero x, and negative three times positive three, which is negative nine. And then when I subtract this entire thing, I get zero x squared, these just cancel, and then minus two x plus zero, because negative nine minus negative nine is just zero. This means that negative two x is my remainder. And I always need to put my remainder over my divisor, which is the denominator in this case. So this becomes minus two x over x squared plus three. So now I need to rewrite the integral. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to write integral of this answer right here, dx. And now I'm going to split it into two separate integrals. The integral of x squared minus three dx minus the integral of two x over x squared plus three dx. And I know exactly what integration technique I'm going to use here. I'm just going to use the power rule. So this half is going to become x cubed over three minus three x. And then this half over here, I'm going to need to use u substitution. So I'm going to say let u equal x squared plus three. And when I take the derivative, I get that du dx is equal to two x. So I can see that I have a two x dx up here in my original integral. So if I multiply both sides of this little equation by dx, I will get that du is equal to two x dx. Then when I rewrite this integral, I have the integral of one over u because u is x squared plus three. And then the two x dx, we swap that out for du. Then I integrate and I get the natural log of the absolute value of u, which is really the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus three. And then this is a situation where we don't actually need the absolute value bars. And if you think about why, it's actually pretty simple. If you are squaring a number, that's always going to be positive. And if you add three to a positive number, that's always gonna be positive. So if we want to, we could just say it's the natural log of x squared plus three, taking off those absolute value bars because they're just not really necessary here. The very last step is to put together this and this to make my final answer. And we do have a negative sign between these here. So it will be x cubed over three minus three x minus the natural log of x squared plus three plus c on the end. And there's my answer. Let's think about this problem for a second. What happens if you try to use u substitution to solve this integral? Well, I would probably set u equal to nine minus four x squared. And then when I take the derivative, I would get that du dx is equal to negative eight x. Then when I multiply both sides by dx, I get that du is equal to negative eight x dx. Then normally at this point, we would look back to our original problem and we'd start looking for something to swap out. Maybe it's negative eight x dx, maybe it's x dx, but unfortunately all that we see in the numerator here, we only see three dx. And that's really not going to help us. This means that u substitution is probably not the best method to use to solve this problem because we can't really do it once we get here, we're stuck. This is where inverse trig antiderivatives come into play. They can help you solve problems that are unsolvable or very difficult to solve using u substitution. There are three rules that you need to memorize for inverse trig antiderivatives. The first one is that the integral of du over the square root of a squared minus u squared is equal to arc sine or the inverse sine of u over a plus c. The next is that the integral of du over a squared plus u squared is equal to one over a times arctan of u over a plus c. The last one is that du over u times the square root of u squared minus a squared is equal to one over a times the arc secant of the absolute value of u over a plus c. Let's practice with this example that we tried to do before using u substitution, but we couldn't do. Now we're going to actually solve it using inverse trig antiderivatives. The very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to identify what is a squared and what is u squared. So which one of these patterns am I going to need to use? Well, it looks like it's matching the pattern for the antiderivative of this one, which is arc sine pretty closely because we have square root of something minus something. And these look like things that could be squared. So I'm going to say a squared is equal to nine. And this would mean that a is equal to three. And then I'm going to say u squared is equal to four x squared, which means that u is equal to two x. Now the a, since that one's a constant, that's not one that you need to worry about anymore. But normally whenever we see the u, we need to take the derivative of that so we can get what is du in terms of dx. So now we say du dx, we're taking the derivative of this tiny equation right here, du dx is equal to two. This means that du is equal to two dx or dx is equal to one half du. 
This is going to be useful when we start substituting things out. So now I'm going to rewrite the integral. I'm going to pull the three out front. That's a constant multiple. It's three times the integral of one over the square root of a squared minus u squared. And then since I have my u in there now, I can't be writing dx anymore. I have to plug in one half du. So times one half du on the end. Now I don't like that one half being in the middle of that. So I'm going to bring it up to the front three times one half multiplying those two constant multiples together. That gets me three halves times the integral of one over the square root of a squared minus u squared du. And now with this portion, I can just use my pattern directly. So that is equal to the arc sine of u over a plus c. So we have three halves times arc sine u over a plus c. The very last step is to plug in u and a. So the answer is 3 halves times the arc sine or the inverse sine of 2x over 3 plus c. And now we have been able to solve that problem that we couldn't do using u substitution. We can use our inverse trig antiderivatives instead. Example 2 says find the integral of 10x over 16 plus 25x to the fourth dx. Now the first thing I'm going to do is see which one of these patterns does it look like it matches. Well, this looks like it would potentially match the arctan pattern, so I'm going to try going down that route. I'm going to say let a squared equal 16. So if a squared is equal to 16, that means that a is equal to 4. And let u squared equal 25x to the fourth. This means that u is equal to 5x squared. Now that I have my u, I can take du dx, which is going to be 10x. And then if I multiply both sides by dx, I get that du is equal to 10x dx. Fortunately, this matches exactly what I have up here. So the 10x dx, I'm going to swap out for a du. I'm going to rewrite this integral. It's the integral of 1 over a squared plus u squared du. And now that is perfectly matching my arctan pattern right up here. So now I'm going to start using my arctan pattern. So that is really equal to 1 over a times arctan of u over a plus c. Then I plug in my u's and a's. So this is really 1 fourth times the arctangent of 5x squared over 4 plus c. And there is my answer. Here's a third problem that we're going to use inverse trig antiderivatives for. So we have the integral of dx over x times the square root of 16x to the fourth minus 49. Well, this looks like it is pretty closely matching our pattern for arc secant, but it's not exact because we don't have this u and the u squared. We have x and 16x to the fourth. So how are we going to remedy that 16 and make it so that it fits the arctan pattern perfectly? Well, I'm going to use double u substitution. I'm going to say let u squared equal 16x squared, and that means that u would be equal to 4x. And then I will write if a squared is equal to 49, that means that a is equal to 7. Now I need to bring the u equals 4x over here so that I can take the derivative of both sides. If I have du dx, that's just going to be equal to 4. Therefore, du is equal to 4dx, but since I only have a dx up here, I need to isolate dx. So dx is equal to 1 fourth du. That looks better. Now, when I rewrite my integral, I'm going to have 1 over x times the square root of u squared minus a squared times 1 fourth du. Now, there are a few problems in here. The first one is that I want to bring this 1 fourth out to the front. And the second one is that I cannot have an x in here. I should never ever be writing something where I have a mix of x's and u's and a's in here. So how can I get this to be in terms of u? Well, I'm going to take this little equation, u is equal to 4x, and if I divide both sides by 4, I get that x is equal to u over 4, or 1 fourth u. So now instead of writing x, I'm going to write 1 fourth u times the square root of u squared minus a squared. And that is all with the du at the end. Now this is actually going to cancel really, really nicely. Because if I am dividing this entire thing by a 1 fourth, that means that I am really multiplying it by 4. And I can bring the 4 out as a constant multiple. So this is really 4 times 1 fourth times the integral of 1 over u rad u squared minus a squared du. And that 4 and that 1 fourth are just going to cancel. Those are just going to become 1. So I'm really just dealing with the integral of 1 over u times the square root of u squared minus a squared du. And that perfectly matches my pattern for arc secant. 
So now I'm going to apply the rule for arc secant and just rewrite this. The very last thing I do is plug in my A's and U's. And there's my answer. Now we're going to integrate using a process called completing the square. Completing the square is a process that is typically covered in Algebra 1 or Algebra 2. In case you're a little bit rusty, I did put in one example where we are just going to practice completing the square. And completing the square is a method that we can use to write an unfactorable quadratic in a more understandable way or just in a different way. To complete the square, we're going to take the x squared and the 8x, and we are going to rewrite that as x plus 4 squared. I got the 4 by taking this b term here and cutting it in half. So you always take the b term and cut it in half. So we have x plus 4 squared. And if we were to FOIL this out, we would get x squared plus 8x plus 16. So the x squared and the 8x match, but since we have actually added a 16 by rewriting it in this format, we need to subtract a 16 from the end to compensate. So this is x plus 4 squared minus 23 minus 16, or x plus 4 squared minus 39. This is equivalent to this unfactorable quadratic right up here, x squared plus 8x minus 23. That's not something we can factor, but what we can do instead to maybe make it simpler or use a different method is to rewrite it using completing the square. Now we're going to practice doing that with integration. In our first example, we have the integral of 7 over x squared minus 6x plus 13 dx. Now in this denominator, this looks like something that I would typically go to factor. If I saw something like that, I would try to factor. The problem is, this is not a factorable quadratic. So what we're going to have to do instead is we're going to have to complete the square with this denominator. So I'm actually just going to bring the denominator down here. So the first thing I do x minus 3 because I cut the middle term, which was negative 6, cut that in half, x minus 3 squared plus 13. And then I need to figure out what is that remaining term that I am adding or subtracting to the end. So x minus 3 squared, if you FOIL that out, that is really x squared minus 6x, which was what we were replacing, plus 9. Since we've really added a 9 by writing this chunk right here, what we need to do is subtract a 9 from the end. So this is really x minus 3 squared plus 4. So I can rewrite the integral with x minus 3 squared plus 4 as my new denominator. I'm also going to pull out the 7 as a constant multiple. So we have 7 times the integral of 1 over x minus 3 squared plus 4 dx. Now this looks like it's matching one of my inverse trig rules. If I look over at my rule for arctan, this is du over a squared plus u squared, or 1 over a squared plus u squared with a du at the end, and that is pretty closely matching my pattern right here. The only thing that I don't like is that the a squared is typically the constant, so I'm just going to switch around the x minus 3 squared and the 4. Now I can use my rule for the inverse tangent. So I'm going to say if a squared is equal to 4, that means that a is equal to 2. And if u squared is equal to x minus 3 squared, that means that u is equal to x minus 3. Then once I have the u, I take du dx, and that is equal to 1, because the derivative of x minus 3 is 1. So du is equal to dx. Now I can go through and rewrite my integral using u's and a's instead of all of these numbers. And I also subbed in the du for the dx since we know those two to be equal. Now I'm just going to follow my rule for arctangent. So it's going to be 1 over a times the arctan of u over a plus c. And we do have that big 7 as a constant multiple up front, so I'm just going to do 7 times all of that. Then the very last step that I do is I just plug in all of my u's and a's as necessary. So this is really 7 over a, or 7 halves, times the arctan of u over a, which is x minus 3 over 2, plus c. And there is my answer. In part 2, I see an unfactorable quadratic in the denominator. And whenever you see an unfactorable quadratic in your problem, that's a pretty good indication that you are going to want to try completing the square. So first, I'm just going to copy this down and I'm going to rearrange it so that it's in a bit more of an understandable format. I'm going to say negative x squared minus 6x plus 23. Then I really don't like this negative sign out front, so I'm just going to factor a negative out of the entire thing. Now I can start completing the square. So I have my negative out front, and then I'm going to say it is x plus 3 squared, cutting that middle term, which is 6 in half, so x plus 3 squared. However, x plus 3 squared gives me x squared plus 6x plus 9. 
Since I have really added a 9 by rewriting x squared plus 6x in this format, I need to subtract a 9 off the end. So this is really minus 23 minus 9. Then I can go through and simplify a bit. I have that big negative out, out at the front, and then it is x plus 3 squared minus 32. Then I can also redistribute the negative. So I have negative x plus 3 squared plus 32. Alternatively, I can write that as 32 minus x plus 3 squared. And that's actually going to be the format that I want to write it in so that I can match my formula for arcsine. And you'll see how that will work in just a second. So first I'm going to pull the 3 out because I don't really want that interfering. So I have 3 times the integral of 1 over, but instead of writing the square root of this, I'm going to write the square root of this. So square root of 32 minus x plus 3 squared. And I have a dx at the end. Now I see that this is matching my formula for arcsine. I have the square root of a squared minus u squared in my denominator. If I were to say let a equal the square root of 32 and let u equal x plus 3, so then I'm just going to go through and write that out. If a squared is equal to 32, that means that a is equal to rad 32. If u squared is equal to x plus 3 squared, that means that u is equal to x plus 3. Then when I take the derivative of this, du dx is equal to 1, so du is equal to dx. Then I go through and rewrite. I say it's 3 times the integral of 1 over the square root of a squared minus u squared with a du at the end instead of a dx because we know that those are equivalent. Then I can apply my rule for arcsine and I do have that big 3 out front. So it is really 3 times arcsine of u over a and that's 3 times the arcsine of x plus 3 over rad 32 plus c. Now we're going to practice evaluating definite integrals using some of the methods that we just learned. First, I'm looking at the integral from 0 to 5 of 6x minus 2 over 2x plus 3 dx. Remember that to use polynomial long division, the degree of the numerator does not have to be greater than the degree of the denominator, it has to be greater than or equal to the degree of the denominator. In this case, the degrees of the numerator and denominator are equal, they are both 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use long division to rewrite this one. I'm doing 6x minus 2 divided by 2x plus 3. So first, how many times does 2x go into 6x? Well, 3 times. Then 3 times 2x is 6x. 3 times 3 is 9. And then I subtract. Negative 2 minus 9 is negative 11. So this is really 3 minus 11 over 2x plus 3. Let me rewrite the integral. It's the integral from 0 to 5 of... 3 minus 11 over 2x plus 3 dx. Then I can split it into two separate integrals. The integral from 0 to 5 of 3 dx minus the integral from 0 to 5 of 11 over 2x plus 3 dx. Now this one is pretty straightforward. We just take the antiderivative of 3, which is 3x, and we evaluate it at 0 and 5. If you want to review the fundamental theorem of calculus, that is in a separate video. But then for this portion, this is a little bit more complicated. So we are going to need to use u substitution here because there is a function in our denominator. I'm going to say, let u be equal to 2x plus 3. This means that du dx is equal to 2. And du is equal to 2 dx. And then since we just have a dx at the end, this means that we want to isolate dx. So 1 half du is equal to dx. Then, since this is a definite integral, what I need to do is I need to change my bounds because it's no longer our x bounds, we need to be dealing with our u bounds. So when x is equal to 0, u is equal to 2 times 0 plus 3, or 3. So when x is 0, u is 3. When x is equal to 5, changing our upper bound, when x is equal to 5, u is equal to 2 times 5, which is 10, plus 3, which is 13. So this means that u is equal to 13. So our new lower and upper bounds respectively are 3 and 13. So we have 3 and 13. If I pull the 11 out, I have the 11 out front. And then 1 over u times 1 half du. I also want to pull the 1 half out front. So I can rewrite this as 11 halves times the integral of 3 to 13 of 1 over u du. 
Then, since this is a definite integral, first I need to find what's the antiderivative of 1 over u du. Well, that's the natural log of the absolute value of u, and I'm evaluating that at 3 and 13. And that entire thing needs to be multiplied by 11 halves because 11 halves is my constant multiple. Now, when I actually go through and evaluate this, I'm going to have 11 halves times the natural log of the absolute value of 13. The absolute value of 13 is just 13, so it's really 11 halves times the natural log of 13 minus the natural log of the absolute value of 3, which is just 3, so the natural log of 3. Now, when we have a natural log thing written like this, you can rewrite this as 11 halves times the natural log of 13 thirds. Remember, subtracting two natural logs means that you divide by what's inside. So this is the actual value for this portion right there. So now I just need to evaluate this. So we have 3 times 5, which is 15, minus 3 times 0. So this is really 15. Then when I combine these, don't forget that you have a negative sign in between there. So we have 15 minus 11 halves times the natural log of 13 thirds. And that would be my answer. Now, I just want to briefly address a common mistake that people sometimes make when you are dealing with definite integrals and u substitution. So what we do here is we switch the bounds because once we switch from x to u, we never again plug in that value of x for u. We just leave it as the natural log of u and then we start plugging in our numbers for u. But what people will sometimes do is they will come down from this step right here where we have this integral and they will say, oh, well, that's 11 halves times the natural log of the absolute value of u evaluated at 3 and 13. And then they'll say, but wait, don't we need to actually go plug in 2x plus 3 for u? So then they go through and they say 11 halves times the natural log of the absolute value of 2x plus 3 evaluated at 3 and 13. You cannot do this. You can't do this because we've already transitioned over to having our u bounds. When you are dealing with your u bounds, you can only plug those numbers in for u. You cannot go plug those in for x. You can, however, if you don't like bound switching at all and you'd prefer to just stick with your x bounds the entire time, what you can do is instead of evaluating this at 3 and 13, you can take your original x bounds, which were 0 and 5. So you can say evaluate it at 0 and 5 and you can do that instead. And that will work because then you are dealing with your x bounds, plugging it in for x. If you do that, you will get the same exact answer up here, the 11 halves times the natural log of 13 thirds. But you just cannot mix plugging in your u bounds when you're dealing with x or plugging in your x bounds when you're dealing with u. If you switch to your u bounds, you have to leave it as u. If you keep your x bounds, you have to switch it back to x at the end. Here is our last problem. We're looking for the integral from 1 to e squared of x minus 2 over x squared minus 4 dx. When I look at the integrand x minus 2 over x squared minus 4, I see a few possibilities. Maybe I could use u substitution. Maybe I would say let u equal the denominator. Potentially, I could use long division. However, I know that I'm not going to be able to use that because in order to use polynomial long division to solve, the degree of the numerator needs to be greater than or equal to the degree of the denominator. And in this case, 1 is not greater than or equal to 2. But when I'm looking at this, I see an even easier possibility. I can factor the denominator. And in that case, I would have x minus 2 over x plus 2 times x minus 2. And then something is going to cancel really nicely. I can cancel the x minus 2 from the top and the bottom. And then I'm left with the integral from 1 to e squared of 1 over x plus 2 dx. That is perfect. Then I can just use u sub. So I will say let u equal x plus 2. Therefore, du dx is going to be equal to 1. So du will be equal to dx. So when I rewrite this, I will have the integral of 1 over u du. But then I need to change my bounds. So when x is equal to 1, u is going to be equal to 1 plus 2, or 3. So 3 is my new lower bound. When x is equal to e squared, my previous upper bound, u is going to be equal to e squared plus 2. Using that equation right there, u is equal to e squared plus 2. So e squared plus 2 is my new upper bound. Then remember, since I have switched to my u bounds, I am not going to plug in x plus 2 for u. I'm just going to evaluate this straight away because I've already switched to my u bounds. So I'm going to take the antiderivative of 1 over u, which is the natural log of the absolute value of u, and I'm going to evaluate that at 3 and at e squared plus 2. This means that I have the natural log of the absolute value of e squared plus 2 
minus the natural log of three. And then let's think about whether we really need the absolute value bars around here. If we have e squared, we know that e is a positive number. So we're squaring a positive number and then adding two. That is automatically going to be positive. So this is really just the natural log of e squared plus two minus the natural log of three. And remember, when we subtract two natural logs like that, we can really just write it as the natural log of e squared plus two over three. That would be our answer.